Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1 through 15. And it reads as follows. So then, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, rather his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, Sychar, near the parcel of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus tried from his excuse me, Jesus tired from his journey, was just sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus replied to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself, and his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to drink water. Read for you John 4, verse 1 through 15. Let those that hear his word live his word. And without any further delay, bring to you our spiritual shepherd, the man that God has entrusted us to. I ask that you open your hearts, open your mind, open your soul, because you can't receive anything if you don't open to receive it. Without any further delay, I humbly bring to you our pastor, Stacy Brand. Church, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I truly appreciate it. This year has been a whirlwind just with COVID and all of those things, but God has still held us together and I think has made us strong. Amen. And I just ask that, he can, that you continue to work with me so I work with him, we work with each other, and I just know God has so many great things for this church and I'm just excited. So I, I'm humbled, humbled to be in leadership there. And thank you so much again. Just looking right now, I just want to say good morning to each and every one of you. I can say that this is the day that the Lord has made. And I'll rejoice if I have to go by myself. All right. I'll rejoice if the world isn't the way I think it should be. I'll rejoice even though it's tax season and COVID is still raging these Americans. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Church, I rejoice because God's been too good. God is an awesome God. 
He is a merciful God. He is a peaceful God. He is God Almighty. I will rejoice. So today, church, I know that it's the second Sunday in the month of February. So that reminds me that we are still in Black History Month. So if you give me just 60 seconds, I'd like to talk about a local historical piece of black history. All right. So the story starts of a religious institution that was founded by an all-white congregation. Mm. The times were still slavery, and in these times, the slave owners allowed their slaves to attend church with them. Now, this particular religious institution had bold pastors, and here's what I mean by that. There was one pastor who actually baptized slaves. All right. And at that time, that was extremely controversial. Mm -hmm. Now, as the city grew, the institution changed. And a lot of its members went in deeper into the city and they left the slaves, the church. All right. So as slavery ended, the church became a African-American religious institution. Now, this church has survived for over 150 years mm -hmm. and has continued to be a beacon of hope and life in its community. It's a historic little church All right. found on Newberry Road in Gainesville, Florida. I believe you've heard of this church. It's called Greater Four O'Clock Missionary Baptist. Amen. A church that has seen its ups, but a church that has also seen its downs. But a church that has always had God's hand on it. So let us celebrate this historical religious institution. This little piece of black history in Alachua County. Because I know that God still has his hand on us. And will take us into another 150 years. Now church, not only is it still Black History Month. But it is also Valentine's Day. A day that is set apart to celebrate love. It's funny, I can't remember the last time that a Valentine's Day actually fell on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. But to me, it could not be fitting enough that we are celebrating a day of love in a day in which we worship the author of love. Come on, somebody. See, church, I understand that Valentine's Day is a very commercial holiday. That retailers have started since January the 2nd promoting sales of jewelry, of candy, and romantic dinner destinations. Mm -hmm. So men, I am going to be brief. So if you haven't taken care of your lady love, you can go and purchase something for her. Because I'm looking out for you. Thank you. Tomorrow, I don't want your breakfast to be extremely hot grits. Hello, somebody. <laughs> See, if we look beyond the commercialism aspect of Valentine's Day, what does a day of love mean in the life of the Christian? See, I'm not really a thematic preacher, meaning that I usually don't try to jump on the theme of the day or the week, but to celebrate a day of love is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You see, I like to look at this day and see what the Bible teaches us about love. See, the Bible in no uncertain terms tells us that God is love. That there is no greater love than this. That one laid down his life for his friend. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have life everlasting. Yeah, yeah. See, the Bible is full of love. Because love is the essence of who God is. So I look for a text that would embody the love of our God. A text that would be appropriate for today's discourse. And I was led to what we found in John 4, actually 1 through 49. But for the sake of today's message, we're just going to look at the verses found in John 4, 4 through 18, and John 4, 39 through 42. And actually, I'm going to start a little lower than that because it was read so eloquently, and I just want us to pull out the things that we need for today's message. All right. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like for you to turn to John 4, and I just want you to look at verse 7. And it reads, 
There comes the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me a drink. For his disciples were going away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria, Ask him, How is it thou, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? Which I am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it was that asked thee, Give me a drink, that would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Going down to verse 15. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Jesus said unto her, Call unto thee thy husband for him to come. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said, Well, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and thou whom we are with now is not your husband. It is said, Thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive, perceive that thou art a prophet from God. Going down next into the 25th verse. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I that speak unto thee am he. Oh, hello, Holy Ghost. See, in the reading we find ourselves amid a conversation between Jesus and and a woman of Samaria. Right, right. Now, John opens up the story and he informs the reader that Jesus is journeying through Samaria and he becomes tired and he sat down on the edge of a well. Now, I love how the text opens up and says that Jesus was tired because that means that just as I become tired, my Lord and Savior also became tired. That deity experience the same thing that happens to me after a long day of work. Wow. That deity experience the same thing that happens to me when I'm in a car ride for too long. That same fatigue that overtakes my body, Jesus experienced it and more. See, Jesus wanted to experience it because he wanted to know all that it meant to be human so that he could take everything to the cross for your sins and for my sins. He knew us better than we knew ourselves. So the lady from Samaria comes as he's sitting there on the way. And Jesus asked a simple question. Will you give me a drink? See, in our modern society, this doesn't seem like there's any problem with it. This doesn't seem like there was any issue. But in the ancient world, for an unmarried man to speak to a woman was not customary. See, not only this, but Jesus was a Jew. And the woman was a Samaritan. See, Jews and Samaritans had a checkered past. And this was something that was not performed in that society for a Jew and a Samaritan to interact. See, I liken it to a black man who was speaking to a white woman in the height of the Jim Crow South. See, it was a conversation that would have gotten them in a world of trouble. That's right. So Jesus asked for a drink, and the woman, she checks him. Yep. And she replies and says, you asked me for a drink? Uh -huh. See, remember, Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. Then Jesus lovingly responds and informs her that if she knew the gift of God, and who it was that asked her for a drink, she would have asked him for a drink and he would have easily given her living water. Now, when the woman hears this, she still is thinking with her natural mind. She informs Jesus that this well is deep and where would I get or where would he get the living water? She obviously saw that he had nothing to draw from and nothing to put down into the well. So naturally, where would this water come from? Jesus tells her that if you drink of this well's water, you're going to thirst again. But if you get the water that I can provide, the water that can only come from me, you will never thirst again and it will come up in you and spring up into eternal life. My Lord, I tell you, I feel like preaching today. Amen. So after he tells
said right. Because it gives her pause at that time to reflect on her life. To reflect on her past saying that she had five husbands previously and currently the man that she was with wasn't the husband. To think about the mistakes and to think about how even though she made mistakes in her life, God could correct them. I know that's what he did for me, and I'm pretty sure that's what he did for you when he met you on that proverbial way, amen? When you met Jesus, he gave you time for self-reflection. When the human touched the deity, the deity allowed us to look inside of ourselves. Yeah. But see, not only did he cause her to think, but he also revealed to her who he was. That's right, that's right. See, she had a little theology. Yeah. You know, she'd gone to Asbury and she <laughs> took it a couple of courses there. Yeah. And some seminary of sorts. And she had a little theology on the side and she said, you know what? I know Messiah is going to come. Yeah. That means I know the Savior of the world, the Messiah is going to come. And when he comes, he will tell us about everything. Yeah. He'll let us know about it all. But then deity admits who he is. And he said, I, the one who you are speaking to, yeah. am he, yeah. oh God. See, imagine the amazement that she experienced. Imagine the happiness that came over her when she recognized that God was there in front of her. That Christ was talking to her in person. The Christ that was foretold. The Christ that can heal the sin sick soul was in flesh, yeah. in front of her. So she went to town. Now in John's text, it doesn't say that she ran to town because I know a lot of people say she ran, but I know she was in a hurry because she left her water vessel there at the way. So she ran into town and she gave her testimony. See, I'm sure she told the people about a man who had told her her life story. I'm sure she spoke about the eloquence of his words and how he lovingly spoke to her. I'm sure the words were so convincing that they sparked interest on how they could also receive this living walk. See, her words were so convincing that the crowd went to seek Jesus. Mm -hmm. They themselves wanted to meet the Christ. Now, church, it's funny about a testimony. See, when it's genuine, and when it's heartfelt, that someone who will hear it will be convicted. And when they're convicted, they'll want to turn to Jesus. But this testimony was like none of them. Because she testified in the midst of a crowd, and the crowd went to go see Jesus. Or imagine us testifying in front of a crowd. And just 50% of them coming in to see Jesus. What a world we would live in and what a great day it would be. So the crowd compelled to see Jesus went to him and they actually compelled the master to stay more time with him so they could suck up his goodness, so they could get his reason, so they could gain understanding. And Jesus stayed with them two days. And that said, at the text it also says that because he stayed that many became new believers. But see, I love the 42nd verse of this fourth chapter of John. Because it says that the crowd said to the woman, no longer do we believe because of what you say. No longer do we believe because of just your testimony. But we believe because we have now also heard it for ourselves. We know for a fact that this man is the Savior of the world. Come on, somebody. So, yes, Bible scholars, I know that the central theme of this text is salvation. I know that when we talk about the story of the woman in the well, we see it in terms of salvation. The idea, unbeknownst to her, is that she was speaking to a living Savior. And when he revealed himself, he gladly gave her living water. He gladly gave her that pathway to eternal life. And she also encouraged others to follow him. So yes, it is a story of salvation. But even though this is the central theme, I wanted to look at the interaction between the Samaritan woman and Jesus. See, he came to her not as an accuser, 
but as a savior. He came to her not as a king that was puffed up, but as a friend. See, in this small interaction, he came to her in such a loving way that it transformed not only her day, but that it transformed her life. Mm -hmm. See, in looking at this, it gives me pause to want to understand the love that Jesus can only give to come into the knowledge of what love is and right. what it can do for my life and what it can do for your life. So to leave you with a thought for today, a little something on this Valentine's Day 2021. I want to know what love is. I want to know what love is. Now church, in 1984, it's been some years ago, a group by the name of Form wrote a ballad. Mm -hmm. And that ballad was called, I Want to Know What Love Is. That's right. See, the writer of that song said that it started out as a relationship song. Mm -hmm. But as he was writing the song, it was guitarist Mick Jones, he said that his personal relationships started to transform into his universal relationships. Mm -hmm. See, he said he was going to write the song about things that had failed and relationships that he had with women and that he was looking for something that was real. Right, right. But he said as he recorded the song, it started to take on a life of its own and he even had the New Jersey choir sing back up for him. See, according to Mr. Jones, the song became about universal love and he said it was almost the gospel song. Uh -huh. But see, now through the years, this song has been recorded by many churches. It's been sung by Mariah Carey and even debuted in the movie Pacific Rim, which came out in 2018. See, in this song, it questions real love. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he sings about the heartaches and the pitfalls of human love. In this song, the singer wants to reveal love and he was pleading with someone to show him what love is. Now, I'm pretty sure all of us can relate to this plea. In the experiences of love and in the experiences of relationships, we are all looking for something that is more substantial. See, many people don't want to forever date, but instead they want closeness to a particular person. See, we are built for a love that is more than erotic or romantic. A love that will not go away and a love that cannot be bought or sold. A love that can only be provided by an eternal deity. A love that only comes from God. See, God's love is perfect. And it's chronicled best in 1 Corinthians 13. In the scripture, it speaks about just love itself. But it seems to be a representation of God's love for us. He says that love is patient and love is kind. That love is not jealous and that love is not boastful proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It does not keep record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful and love will endure under every circumstance. Yes, this is the type of love we aspire to have. But this is the very love that is given to us by God. See, the question is then posed, how do we obtain this love? Right. It is simply a gift from God. It is not something that we must earn. But this love, i.e. his love, is something that we must trust. See, when I think of this, I recall a story about the little girl whose grandmother was baking cookies with her. And she said, Grandma, why do your cookies always taste so good? And her grandmother responds and says, Baby, because in each bite, I put a little love. See, if Grandma can do it, why not a holy God? If Grandma can bake with love, why can't God bless with love? See, I believe he shares the embodiment of his love when he wakes us up in the morning. I believe that he shares the embodiment of his love when he keeps us safe on the highways and the byways. I believe that he shows us the embodiment of his love when he allows us to have food on our tables and the means to supply more. When he takes care of us when times are difficult, always being that ray of sunshine and that light of path in the midst of darkness. How he never fails. He keeps us going forward and how he never backs down from a fight. How he always keeps his covenant and how he always stands in the gap. How he's always peace in the midst of confusion and comfort in the time 
not only is it in an unlearned or unbought or undeserved, but it's also a love that is eternal. See, Romans 8, 35 and 37 through 39 says it best. Can anything ever separate us from God's love? Does it mean that he no longer, no longer loves us if we have calamity or are persecuted or have hunger or are destitute or are in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours. No, despite these things, victory will see us through. Because it is victory that gives us through Jesus Christ, who loved us the best. See, I'm convinced, church, that there is nothing, not even the storm or the rain, mm -hmm. that there is nothing, not even wars or rumors of wars, that there is nothing, not even a pandemic that is still in our country. That there is nothing, not even fear of the unknown. That there is nothing, not even anxiety and depression. That there is nothing, not even a downturn in the economy. Nothing that can ever separate us from God's love. Church, it is eternal. It is forever and it will always be with us. But now let's look back to the conversation with the Samaritan woman. When she started to draw water on that day, she never in her wildest dreams would imagine who she encountered. Right. See, Jesus was most likely not even on her radar. Mm -hmm. Yet she may have thought that she would have saw other women at the well, but the Savior of the world never in her wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. On an ordinary day, Performing a necessary but medial task. Love in the form of Jesus Christ showed up at that way. Yes, it did. See, love in the form of Jesus Christ introduced himself as a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. Love showed that the Savior of the world came in the form of an enemy, but really was a friend. Love spoke to her honestly about her situation and broke her down. But love didn't leave her there when he broke her down. He built her back up and informed her that he was the savior of the world and from him she could obtain life everlasting. Love caused her to self-reflect and in that reflection she accepted love as her own. No longer would she question it, she, would she work. No longer would she realize that her work was more than just harm. No more would she think that her work was found in but that her work was found in Jesus Christ. Oh, I wish I had some believers. Because love called the Samaritan woman to go tell a town about a man that knew her better than she knew herself. Love caused the town to hear a testimony. And they wanted to go see Jesus for themselves. And in turn, they came believers. Love showed up that day for them, but love can show up today for you. All you have to do is be willing and ready to accept the love of Jesus Christ. A love of a risen Savior, accepting the love as your own. All you have to do is drop your God and allow him to step in and take care of rest. Under the understanding only in him can you experience true love. Only in Jesus will you understand what it means to have love and be loved by a holy God. Only in Jesus will you find love everlasting. Now, from the text, we see a woman who didn't know how really broken she was. Right, right. She met the master at a well, and in that instance, her life was changed forever. Be free. On that day she found true love yes, and embraced it. In this quest for love, on this celebration of Valentine's and in this journey of relationships, many questions arise. Mm -hmm. I believe that the question that comes the most was asked by that lead singer of Foreigner when he asked and wanted to know what love is. For that church, I have a simple answer. Love is Jesus Christ. Love is a risen saint. Love is a holy God. Love is the one who went to the cross for you and me. Love is sitting on the right hand of the Father. Love is interceding for you and me. Love is found in my Savior. That's the answer to his question. That is the answer for our questions. Because he is the embodiment of love Love 
love. And that church is what love is. May God bless you and may God keep you. Those who are at home right now, just listen. 